Good morning, Canada and the United States, and good afternoon, Europe. Welcome to our inaugural International Arts Conference, Cultures Campus, How the Industry Keeps Beating Day 2. My name is Megida Arlo, and I will be your host for today. First of all, I want to thank everyone who joined us yesterday. We had a very saturated day, and for those folks joining us today, you actually still have access to yesterday's sessions. And all you need to do is just log in to Crowdcast, just as you did now, and click the content button on the top left uh, and select this session you're interested in. So uh, I want to thank all of you coming here today. And today we have almost 500 attendees from so many different countries of the world. And it's almost 100 more than we had yesterday. So the bets are rising. Thanks to every single one of you. And now for a welcome word, I want to invite the director of Center for Creative Business Innovation and Humber Galleries, Jennifer Gordon. Jennifer, take it away. Thank you, Makita. Good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here. It's going to be such an exciting day. I'll just do a little recap from yesterday because we seem to have uh, 100 new attendees here, which is fabulous. We are thrilled with this. Welcome all. Um, so I'm the director at Humber's uh, Creative Center for Creative Business Innovation and Humber Galleries. Uh, and the, the concept for this conference came about um, after COVID hit and we were looking at some of the impacts that were happening from from that the fallout that was happening there. Students weren't able to um, find placements uh, live in person, and the arts community was uh, struggling with a number of issues um, across the board as everyone tried to adapt. And then, you know, added to that became the anti-racist issues um, that are impacting everyone and. Um, we, we came together and we thought this is a place where we need to have um, an open space, maybe a safe space for some dangerous dialogue inside here. So welcome everyone and we're, we're thrilled that you're here. The CCBI, just so you know, is a, a new center of innovation within Humber and it's built around um, industry bringing us their problems. That can be anything to do with audience, to do with marketing. It can be big questions, it can be small specifics that need a you know, a fee for service type of, of, a, of a fix on something. So anything that you have like that, feel free to reach out. Um, I think there's lots of things that are coming up as we move through this conference uh, today to, to, um, to look toward for future. Um, one of, we really need to thank our partners, uh, Work and Culture. So big thanks um, to uh, Work and Culture for supporting us and uh, for mentoring us through this and for doing all the amazing outreach that they have have accomplished. We would not have the audience we have right now without you on board and without your expertise in assisting us. So big thank you to you. Um, you know, when we looked at uh, yesterday, I had a few thoughts that sort of popped up and I'm, I'm just going to run through these in, in random. And if you have the same thoughts, that'd be great. If you have different thoughts, we'd love to hear them too, right? These are just things that were sort of sticking in my mind as we moved forward. Um, you know, everything is so tied together. That's the first thing. None of these sessions sort of stands alone. They all weave into each other with overlapping themes and overlapping concerns. Um, you know, how do we untangle money and power from gaze and from access and value and who determines those and who evaluates those pieces? These are all woven together uh, quite densely in the um, systems we currently have set up. So this is a great opportunity to start looking at some of those systems and seeing how we can rebuild and recover in ways that are more healthy, more inclusive and more reflective of who we are and who we wanna be. Um, the second thing I thought of was that no one, including the large, what we traditionally think of as well-resourced um, organizations with longer histories, have any idea how to measure success right now. Um, in some ways that's a little daunting, but in a lot of ways it's comforting, right? It's, we're all struggling with the same thing. We've moved everything online. How do we evaluate this? What are the measures of success? What are these metrics um, as we've shifted into this digital space? So I think there's a lot of opportunity here. The next piece, 
we need to really consider too is that accessibility does not equal online. These two things are not the same. Online is one thing, accessibility is another set of things. They overlap, they interact, but they're not the same thing. Uh, and there's no one size fits all solutions for all of this. Um, we need to choose targeted impacts and pursue those ones that are closest to our hearts that, that we would wanna see, that we would wanna attend, that we would wanna be involved with and that build, um, build a healthier society for us. And I think that's gonna help draw the audience. So it's, I think it's time, it's time to, uh, to measure multiple forms of capital. Traditionally, we've always measured, you know, money as the capital. And it's interesting because in at Humber, we, we had a project going, which was involved uh, involving trying to uh, set up metrics for measuring different types of capital. It's called triple bottom line. I know that some governments um, in Saskatchewan have adopted this. And for example, you could have a line that they say that's your finance, right? That's your traditional capital. And then you could have another line that could be social impact. It could be environmental footprint, uh, different things like that. So I think that it's time that we set up a more holistic set of, of uh, measurements for different forms of capital. Opportunity, I'm excited. Um, the fourth piece is that a lot of people are carrying a lot of weight right now. Uh, you, you know, and I'm looking at you, uh, BIPOC and other marginalized communities, and some folks are tired and hope can be a dangerous thing uh, right now. So for those of us in power positions, um, let's take up some of that burden, uh, do the work for ourselves and really fight for anti-racist and anti-oppression change from within. Um, Thanks today, especially to our activism panel for making space uh, in the middle of the pandemic of anti-Black racism that is go going on. Um, we know that uh, your time is an extremely valuable capital. Um, this is a non sequitur here, but uh, those of you who are joining us yesterday, sober, day distance, comedy seems to work. <laughs> uh, it was really interesting and and you know, congrats to Ms. Tolov for taking the risk and not being able to see and read her audience and still delivering what was a bang up energy raising uh, performance. So it's been really interesting to watch how performance is affected when we move into the digital space, what the limitations are and how we can work with those and leverage them. The next thing is that uh, some artists actually don't wanna perform virtually. Um, so big love and applause to uh, to those that were willing to do that with us and to, and to take that risk. We're really appreciative of that. And uh, the performances have been outstanding. And I know we have two more today that are gonna blow everybody away. Um, money is a tough topic. That's my next point. Uh, a lot of people seem to want to avoid talking about it right now. Um, so thanks again to our panelists today uh, on that finance discussion and on broaching that. and. What do we do about, about money in a situation like this that is so uh, challenging for everyone? So, and the last point I have is that there's volume. There's a lot of volume online right now. And interestingly, one of the, one of the pieces that came out of the discussion we were having yesterday uh, after we wrapped was that there's not a lot of activity online with the hashtags. And um, I was thinking about that and I'm thinking, you know, we're already on a screen, we already see the chat. And it's different from, a, from an in real life conference because you know that way you'd be embodied and you'd be talking to people and then you might grab your device and start to tweet or start to get on other platforms. But right now, um, I think you know everyone is absorbed in this screen and doesn't really have the capacity to like double screen it. That's, that's my guess. Either that or a hashtag is just so brand new that people are... <laughs> Um, not not familiar with it, right? So anyways, those are my theories, those are my thoughts. And um, I thank you all again for joining us. Deep thanks to our partners, um, Diane Davey, uh, In at Work and Culture and Yomi John. And um, I would like to also thank um, our mentors who helped out, uh, including Yomi John, Colleen Smith, Diane Pelliconi, and Alexander Johnson. So without further ado, I will pass the floor now to um, Regina Hartwick uh, for our land acknowledgement. Regina is the Acting Associate Dean of Indigenous Education and Engagement at Humber College. Over to you, Gina.
Okay, so I just have to pull up my PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, so just a quick check. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, good. Um, okay, so I wanted to begin by introducing myself and, and talking a bit about um, uh, what we're actually here uh, in, in the context of, of this part of the presentation to really do. And, and so we're, we're thinking about the land spaces that, that we're all connected to. And so in, in the global scheme, um, the, earth, the earth is our dish. It is that place that, that provides for us and we're all eating out of one spoon. And so in the context of today, I wanna to honor indigenous histories and, and the traditional territories that we're all connected to. Um, so to do that though, I really need to start with who I am as a person. So I wanna begin by introducing myself in my traditional language, which is Anishinaabe Moen. I wanna begin by saying, uh, so in that, I, so that's like a, a traditional greeting uh, where, you know, I talk about all those things that, that really shape me. And so the first thing I talked about, Gina and Dishnikaza just means that that's what my Regina, name is. we're sorry, we can't see your presentation. Can you please turn it on? Oh, <laughs> okay. So I think I might need to share, because I, I have the presentation showing. Um, maybe there's something wrong there. Let me try to share my screen again. Oh, something weird happened, but hopefully you can still see my screen when I show it. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can yeah, see it. Yes, now. thank okay. you. Okay, good. So uh, going back to introducing myself. So um, uh, I, I talked about what, that my name was Gina. Uh, another name that I have is Dewinjige Megaze, which is Searching Eagle. And so that talks a little bit also about who I am and, and my path and progression in life. And so uh, the meaning around my name will change, but at this current moment in my life, it's really about, um, finding my own identity as an Anishinaabe Kwe, uh, which just really means that I'm an Algonquin Anishinaabe woman. Um, and, and then also, you know, part of my responsibilities uh, as a result of the education that I've been given, the teachings I've been given, and, and the experiences I've had throughout my life, and, and where I kind of am in, in you know, like my, even my professional journey, is, is really to help others find their identities, to feel safe and secure in who they are. And so it's a lot of what I do even at Humber in my acting associate dean uh, position is 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 to really create those structures through which indigenous um, students, indigenous faculty, um, staff, and administrators within the concept, context of our institution can feel that safety, can can really uh, learn about who they are, learn about the histories that shape them, and and really determine how they're going to move forward, and and then you know to to create change on the ground in, in indigenous communities. That's that's a big part of of my path and progression uh, and, and, and my focus in life right now. And so I also come from the Kichizibi, which is the Ottawa River Valley. I'm a member of Arda Algonquin First Nation and I'm uh, a member of the Martin clan. And then I'm also related to the turtle clan on my mother's side. And so through those, um, through that little bit there, uh, what you begin to understand is that I am in fact a visitor within a territory that is the treaty and traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, this territory is homeland to Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wyandotte peoples, uh, but my territory is outside this one. And so given that I'm a visitor within this territory, I always have to consider, you know, what is it, uh, what does this mean to be a visitor within somebody else's territory? And, and because of everything I'm given within this territory, 
what are my responsibilities to the people and to this place? And so to begin with, I think a lot about who I am and where I'm situated. And so within Anishinaabe traditions, we have a understanding uh, that that we are shaped by seven generations. And so um, a lot of times when we're thinking about everything we're doing, we're thinking seven generations into the future. But I like to think of myself as being situated in the middle of seven generations. So I am shaped by my parents, I'm shaped by my grandparents, and I'm also shaped by those ancestors and their experiences. And so looking at the experiences of Al Algonquin people specifically, I understand that that they have been experienced by that historical legacy of colonialism and that legacy has been passed down um, to my to my grand my, my grandfather specifically here so up at the top here this is <laughs> it might be a little hard for you to see but like that's little me and that's my grandfather and so through my grandfather he passed teachings down to me. Uh, he passed a lot of teachings and experiences and understandings down to my mother. My mother probably is one of the most important uh, people in my life in terms of passing that knowledge on to me uh, because I have a, a mixed background. So on um, on my uh, biological father's side, I'm Irish, but I don't really know a whole lot about what that means because I didn't grow up with him. I actually grew up in a Narragansett family. Uh, so my... Um, I guess you could call him my stepfather, but he's been my dad since I was three. Um, he raised me, and so he's also indigenous. And so I was raised in that context of of understanding that at the end of the day, blood doesn't matter. That you know, it's those communities and those people who shape you. And so those experiences are a big part of who I am. And so as a result of these histories. I am a part of a clan. So I talked about being a part of the Martin clan, which is extended beyond my individual family, but I'm also a member of that family. And so I inherit those histories of those family, of my family. Um, I, I, at the center of it, land, uh, my, my homeland specifically, but also the, the territories that I'm a part of, they also shape me. My community shapes me, my larger nation. So there's a lot of individual communities within the Algonquin nation. And then overall, I'm also Anishinaabe. So there is a longstanding history of migration and, and coming into being that, that I'm uh, learning about. And so on the other side of that, um, through that that history and that that legacy that's being passed down to me from from those generations before, um, there you know that history of colonialism is in fact being written into the fiber of my being. But so is the strength and courage of those ancestors and and those people who came before. You know they had to find that strength to move on, and through them I learned how to get through the hard times. And so I think there's a, a lot of value in in those teachings that are passed on to you from previous generations. And so I would like to you to, to invite you to think a little bit about those things that have been passed on to you, those values that's been passed on to you, and those places that have really meant a lot to you. When acknowledging land, it's, it's not only important to acknowledge the, the territories that you're on, but also to acknowledge those territories that have shaped you. And so I recognize that connection. And, and for right now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting within the, uh, the, the territory, the, the, you know, the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the credit. And so I, I recognize that I've been within this territory for about 15 years now. And so when you're in a territory and engaging with people and enga engaging with land for that long, it really does start to shape you. And so I think that's become a large part of who I am as well. And, um, and so, um, the, the the Mississaugas of the Credit are the Michisaugi people. And so um, a, a lot of, of my interactions with Michisaugi people have really shaped me. And so all of those things interacting in, in myself are, are also shaping others. So I recognize that I shape the, I, I, you know, in a, in a very real level, I shape my daughter. So this is, this under where it says community right here, this is my daughter Jada. And this is her at, um, she was about eight years old at this time. And at the time in my community, we were fighting against uranium exploration. And, um, you know, like uh, we, we were 
doing a very public um, newscast and uh, they wanted to, you know, like really just hear from the community and she asked to speak. And, you know, she said the most profound thing at eight years old. She talked about how important land was for her and that she wanted to, to have, um, you know, like our territory um, for her for when she grew up. And, you know, like, like at, at seven, eight years old, thinking in that way, you know, like it was just amazing. And, and, and you know, um, that courage to get up and, and speak in that way at a time when, you know, essentially people within her community are, are also being criminalized for their actions. And so that's, that's, that's a, you know, like that's a big thing for her to have that learning. And so she's had things that I never had because of colonialism, but these generations now are getting those things back. And so this is her now, um, not too long ago, she's uh, 20 years old now. And so um, she's, you know, growing into this, this beautiful young woman. And I just, I, I have so much hope for the future because I see what the youth are doing today. I see, you know, the strength in the students that I work with every day. Uh, I have an amazing uh, team of staff that I work with. And so I have a, a lot of hope for what, the you know the children of the future you know possibly my grandchildren away from hopefully a long way from now and and you know those descendants will inherit but i do think that um that we need to really think critically about what we're doing now uh to to really create those those futures and so i think a lot about like what am i leaving for generations to come and so in that thinking um, and connecting to land, I always think about, you know, what is it that I know about the history and contemporary presence of indigenous peoples in the places that I work, learn and call home. So if I am working or going to school or living within a particular territory, and I want you to think about that in the context of, of wherever you are with the, across the globe, you know, what does it mean? to connect? What does it mean to live in places, especially in places where you are a visitor within that territory? What are your responsibilities? You know, what kind of relationships do you maintain with indigenous peoples within those territories? And if you don't know who those indigenous peoples are in the territories, that's a good place to start. And, um, and then, you know, like, what relationships do I maintain with the territories themselves? Am I getting out on the land? I think sometimes we get so stuck in in our everyday lives that that we forget to just get out there and just breathe in you know um fresh air and and, and to really get out and, and experience nature so i also think about you know like what is it that i want to learn i'm 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 going to think that throughout my entire life that i'm always trying to learn more and then um what is it that I need to do right now? So there needs to be that action. So a lot of times people will get up and they'll do a land acknowledgement and they'll just have the script that they speak to. And um, a lot of times it's, you know, like this little tiny uh, script that talks about like the place and, and you don't bring too much of yourself into it. And, I, and I, I think we need to get past that. We need to be able to bring ourselves into, um, into the context of, of like, connecting with land because I mean we are at the center of it we always bring ourselves and and so I think about that um, how I can you know um, help others to support them in their learning journeys and so one of the the really big understandings that has really really guided my thinking of about how I connect to land is this dish with one spoon uh, wampum. So right here, what you see is a wampum belt. These beads right here are made by the Quahog. Um, it, it comes from the Quahog shell. So these are white and these are generally like a purple color. And um, so this is what, you know, historically our, our, our governance and our stories were, were contained within these wampum belts. And so this is a, a, an agreement between, traditionally it was between Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. And then it extended on to those who um, would become um, you know, like come into relationship with us within shared territories. So it was really a, um, a covenant about how you share territories where it's not just one people, multiple people are coming together. And so I have to recognize from the start that, you know, as I said, I'm a visitor within the treaty lands and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and that th this region is a shared homeland for Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wyandotte peoples, but that now in the, in the contemporary context of today, that it's also a vital source of interconnection for all people who live, learn, and work here. And so this land, it provides this great dish. And so you can think of this dish as, as 
you know, this regional territory, or you can think of the dish in, in the context of the places that you live, you know, so this, you know, that dish or even the globe, the globe is our, our global dish. And so what it does is it provides everything that we need to be healthy and well. So it provides animals, birds, fish, everything, water, everything that we need to, to be well, trees, bees. Um, and so if you think about that, everything that the land gives to us, the land and the water, everything that it gives to us, reciprocally as human beings, we are expected to only take what we need. We need to, um, and thinking about those relationships, we need to be really respectful and give back and ensure that we're not taking too much and that, that we're leaving the land in its an abundance and viability so that it can provide for generations to come. Um, I, I think this is especially important to think about in the context of the world that we're living in right now, where, you know, there's, um, there's environmental issues that we're experiencing. Um, there's, there's, you know, social issues that we're experiencing and, and, you know, like, um, uh, many issues around race and, and class. And so I can't help but think about my daughter. So you'll notice that, um, my daughter, you know, like, so in here, she's, she's, you know, she's, she's a different color than me. And um, the one thing that that she has inherited that I so we're both indigenous, but the thing that she's inherited that I maybe necessarily have not is, is, you know, um, a, a layer of fear of, of, of just going out into the world. And, and, you know, worrying that as an indigenous woman, so in Canada, there's um, there's incidents of um, increasing numbers of missing and murdered indigenous women. And so as a parent, one thing that I do worry about is um, how safe she is when she goes out in the world. And I have to say, and it has a lot to do with the color of her skin. So her going out into the world, she has worries that I never had because of the color of my skin. And so uh, these are things that I hope future generations don't have to worry about like you know uh you know like having conversations about how you get pulled over and and how to be safe in that situation i hope we don't have to have those conversations anymore and so so that's what i'm thinking about when i'm thinking about connecting with land i'm also thinking about what are those social structures that that we're creating what can we learn with land what does land teach us and and you know you know about um, how we interact with each other, and so one thing that really comes to mind is this um, quote that actually comes from Chief Seattle, uh, uh, Seattle. And so this is um, thinking about that idea of living within seven generations. That everything I do now isn't so much about me; it's really about like what am I doing? What's the legacy I'm leaving for those generations that have yet to come? And so this quote seems to have a lot of relevance. And so, you know, the idea is that we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And so if we are in fact borrowing the, um, the earth from our children, what are our responsibilities? What will the next generation inherit? You know, like, so thinking about the structures that we live in today, is this the world that we want those future generations to inherit? And if it is, um, you know, so there's really great parts of the world that we live in. And, you know, like, so th there's a lot of things that we could um, really build on and grow. And, and then there's some things that that I think we really need to critically look at, we need to look at the ways in which we, we engage with land, and, and, you know, really developing more sustainable ways of connecting to to the earth itself, and then connecting to each other. And so, you know, what is the legacy that each of us hopes to leave? And so that's the, the two thoughts that that I want to leave you with, and then I guess I'll, I'll open it up also within the chat is to is to really um, like let us know where you're you're calling in or, or connecting in from, you know, like because I know that people are connecting in from all around the globe, and I would love to hear where you might be from, and and if you do know who the traditional peoples are within the territories that you're in, because indigenous peoples are across the globe. It's not just within little pockets. There are indigenous peoples across the globe. And so if you're somebody who, who doesn't really know what that traditional relationship might look like, who those um, indigenous peoples would be within within your territory, I encourage you to learn more. But uh, feel free to leave some comments in the chat just to like let us know where you're coming in from. And, uh, and, and with that, I want to say miigwech, which essentially just means thank you. And um, thank you for listening. 
Thank you so much, Regina, for such a detailed land acknowledgement. Uh, it was Regina Hartwick, Acting Associate Dean, Indigenous Education and Engagement, Hamburg College. So uh, we are almost ready to go. Just a couple of more things uh, before we start. First, please feel free to comment in the chat on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, please just keep your comments appropriate and on topic. Uh, you can also create a discussion outside the conference chat uh, by posting your thoughts on social media. So please just mention our official hashtag Cultures Campus 2020 when you do so. Uh, please put any questions you have for the panelists in the ask and, uh, a question section and go through and upvote other questions you want answered. You are more than welcome to participate in any pools that come up below. And I also want to thank two of our brilliant artists, Jackie Comrie, who is providing some amazing artwork that we see before the start of each session, and Michelle Buchholz. She is Wet'suwet'en and lives in the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil uh Coast Salish peoples, or Vancouver, BC. And she's creating a visual recording of the sessions, which will be shared after the conference. And you can already see the yesterday's uh, artworks on our website and social media. So we are ready for our first session for today. Uh, first presentation is engaging audiences in digital spaces and our speakers are Melan Dwarka, board of member of the Canadian Oprah Company, member of City of Toronto's Economic Development and Culture Thought Leader Panel. Support lead for the Metal Cow Foundation's Creative Strategies Incubator. Member of the inaugural cohort of the Bank Toronto Arts Council Cultural Leaders Lab. A member of the Toronto Arts Council's Board Nominating Committee. Menon has also led several Canadian organizations, including 918 Bathurst, Arts Tobacco, and South Soundstreams. Charity Chen is an arts professional with a long-standing history of working across practices and communities. She is currently the performing arts manager at the Aga Han Museum. In addition to Toronto, she has worked in Montreal throughout the United States, Europe, and Latin America, including time spent at organizations such as uh, Ontario Science Center, Pride Toronto, Production Super Music, and others. So, men and charity, we are ready to welcome you. The stage is yours. Great, thank you. I can only see, I can't see charity yet. Is she, is she available? She's just connecting now, so she'll okay. be on in a moment. Great. I apologize for that super long uh, bio of mine at the front. So, uh, but I, I, I should say, and we'll probably do a, a proper intro when Charity's here, that um, part of why I have a lot of those things is that I, uh, you know, I went to abroad for grad school uh, to New York and stayed there for about 20 years uh, and came back after the passing of my mother. So uh, with all that experience and international uh, um, connections, uh, when I returned back to Toronto, I had a lot of invitations to be parts of different uh, organizations. So um, <laughs> I see some, that's great, Kyla. <laughs> um, and I also should say that I feel super blessed uh, to be connected with Humber uh, because they've been super supportive of many of the initiatives that I've been taking on since I've returned. Uh, I think we started working together uh, when I was at Arts of Tobago. Here's Charity. Hey there. <laughs> Hi, sorry about that, Menon. No worries. I had a bump off too, so maybe uh, I'm not sure what happened, but uh, so I've just been rambling until, until you got here. So uh, why don't we, do we, should we ask the polls? Is that what we should do, Charity? Um, yeah, let's start with the polls. And um, I think we had something that we wanted to open with originally, mm -hmm. which is that when we had started talking, when we, when Men and I first got together and started discussing the presentation in our chat, um, one of the things we wanted to make sure and sort of give advance notice of to our audience, lovely audience from around the world, is that this particular conversation we're about to have isn't really going to cover a how-to for audience engagement on digital platforms. We're both very happy and open to having conversations afterwards and in private um, or after this conference, uh, either by email or chats elsewhere. 
questions to the audience through the Q&A section, so. I think too, just to, just to frame that, uh, that it's not a how-to. Uh, many of you, if you've been following cultural industries in Canada for the last few years, you might have seen when we had our sesquicentennial celebration, there was a uh, an organization that uh, toured um, uh, immersive 3D um, film uh, experiences. And what was really interesting is that because of the long timelines of government procurement, they bought a bunch of equipment and it was re right at the bleeding edge of what was available. And by the time the project arrived, most of the technology had already been outdated. So I think that what we want to do, and that was only, a, I think, maybe a year on the outside. So I think what we want to focus on is uh, not the particulars of today, but how we can actually discuss uh, some strategies and thinking around digital presentation that could be ongoing. So it's not just tied to this moment, although I'm sure Charity and I are both uh, very interested to talk about our experience regarding COVID-19. Uh, but we want to give a, a broad framing of what's going on uh, in the world right now with, with regard to digital. Uh, also, uh, Charity, maybe we they did have a little uh, intro of both of us in terms of our jobs, but maybe while the, the, um, the votes are coming in, could you speak a little about yourself first? Of course. Um, I'm currently working as a performing arts manager at the Aga Khan Museum. My background was originally in performance, academic research, composition, programming, creative production. It was, the arts has a tendency to attract people who enjoy wearing many hats. And I've now had the opportunity to wear several different hats for this. Um, since COVID has started and the shutdown has taken place here in Toronto, one of the things, one of the new hats I've been wearing is as a creative producer and programmer for performing arts for the museum, for the Aga Khan Museum's virtual museum, Museum Without Walls program. And I also oversee the creative production and digital production for our current content. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a very interesting three months, three and a half months of change and growth and development. Um, I know, on the other hand, Menon has also been actively busy with, work, with his work with sound streams and the changes that have taken place there. That's right, yes. And, and uh, uh, I should apologize to my uh, marketing manager who's probably watching this that, that the original intro did not include uh, my sound streams moniker. Uh, so I am the executive director of sound streams as well as all those other things. I think it's interesting that there are two people online today who are going to talk about digital culture who are in effect, you know, uh, trained musicians and composers. And there's probably some time between what we do as musical thinkers and structure builders uh, in sound, as well as uh, this essential, uh, this is essentially one about visual uh, organization and dissemination. So uh, I think we're gonna, um, if, if anyone can chime in with the poll, uh, but maybe Charity, we can have a quick look at what's come in already. Um, I think it's really interesting that the, the, one of the questions, has anyone discovered any new artists or art, artwork since the shutdown? 88% uh, have said yes, which is great, much higher than I thought. Uh, but if anybody uh, can uh, chime in with who they've discovered in the chat, that would be really great. Mm -hmm. um, Charity, maybe you want to read out one of the other uh, The other one was how many people have used a digital platform for arts consumption since the shutdown from COVID in mid-March? And also which platforms? So one of the questions was other. Uh, without too much surprise, there's quite a lot of, um, there's actually a few votes for social media platforms. But out of curiosity, which were the other platforms that people have actually had made use of? If you can answer in the chat, that would be fantastic. I've seen a couple of Instagrams, which is surprising to me, but that's great. Uh, it might be one of them is a visual artist, which is interesting. So that, that's interesting to think about. Um, yeah, there's another Instagram. So that's great. Uh, so why don't we begin talking? Uh, you know, one of the things Charity and I had a, a pre-chat before this. And one of the things that we found is that, you know, Charity's work in music has also been tied to uh, specific cultural groups. And 
It is currently with the Aga Khan Museum because of our focus on Islamic art and artists. Um, but we also have a mandate, a social mandate for promoting pluralism, um, social exchange, uh, cultural exchange, artistic exchange, and building bridges between cultures. So it tends to touch base on a lot of different cultural communities, both here in Toronto, because Toronto is one of the most, the most diverse city in the world, and also elsewhere abroad too. Uh, I think before we kind of, uh, I think it's important for the two of us to acknowledge something uh, in what we speak about. Jennifer at the top of this uh, broadcast today talked about the differences between uh, online and accessible. And I think that one of the things uh, that we should talk about charity is uh, the kind of uh, aesthetics and culture that actually is assumed in this digital space. Do you have any, any thoughts about digital space in general being connected to a specific vantage point or? One of the elements I know Jennifer brought up and also I believe was touched on briefly yesterday in a conversation between Deviani, Julie and um, Gaetan was that we have a tendency to think of digital platforms and digital spaces as being fully accessible, as being um, something that anyone from any part of the world at any point can have access to. And there's a presumption that there's a built-in level of equitability and equality on these platforms. And given the current social climate, especially in the United States and also here in Canada, um, part of the conversation has to do with what men and I were speaking about for our conversation was that digital platforms are fundamentally socialized. Who has access, how they have access, um, a lot of times our presumption for digital platforms is also that there is that it's internet based. And a lot of how we think about technology tends to be very two dimensional. We don't necessarily think of it as being a social or cultural sphere that has just as much breadth or detail or forms of availability for forms of engagement as we do for an in person experience. So Menon and I both currently especially work very much in the realm of live performance and live production. And we're fortunate in that when we do those presentations, a lot of that work is, a lot of our work is already inherently, the socializations are perhaps more visible because we've spent more time thinking about how those socializes, socializations take place, how audience members interact or consume or engage with what's being presented on the stage. And currently, because we've now moved to what's effectively a two-dimensional space in terms of technology, because of the emphasis on visual culture, that's not just about sound or about performance or about um, presentation, is that we have to sort of now reconsider, well, where, where's the depth that exists on these digital platforms? Because when you want to talk about audience engagement and interaction, you can't really address it in a very impactful or meaningful way without thinking about how how a person's relationship with that platform with that medium is or currently exists and, I, and i'll add that I, I think one of the big things for everyone to to really consider as they are moving into digital space and i you know i think oftentimes uh our our leadership uh whether it's executive directors or boards or donors, the, there's often uh, a knee-jerk reaction to digital space. So I remember many, many years ago when everybody was entering the digital space, uh, boards were very excited to have websites for their organizations, but they had no thoughts about the content or how that uh, how that actually pushes out their their branding and their messaging. And I think I, I think it's safe to say right now that everybody who is in a performing arts organization there's this real strong thing. Well, you can't go to a theater now, so let's just transfer this over to digital. And I think, kind of, just addressing what Charity was saying, that this is a this is a different animal, uh, and many of the ways that these art forms were constructed uh, were never intended to be shown on a um, on a small screen. Uh, you know, this is a. I, I'm assuming that this is a PG rated talk. But if anyone is interested, there's a, um, a, a YouTube video of someone asking David Lynch about 
what his thoughts are about seeing a movie on a phone. And it, it's, it's pretty short, but it's pretty brutal. Uh, and I think, I think one of the things that we really need to keep in mind is um, that digital accessibility is not like TV with a keyboard attached to it. Uh, and there are tremendous opportunities, I think, for a different way of communicating with our audiences and seeing material, uh, not just because it's interactive. There's just, um, you know, television was uh, an adaptation of theater. Uh, and much television, as most people know, came out of New York City, where it was the, the center of theater. Uh, but we have an opportunity here to rethink and reinvent some things uh, that will be truly engaging. So, um, Charity, I'd be curious to, to hear, has that kind of review of material broadcast out of, out of Aga Khan, have you guys been beginning that conversation as well? We have, to some extent. We've started, we had originally planned to have a virtual museum but the timeline for rolling out this project was fast forwarded very rapidly yeah, sure. um, in the course of the last couple of months. I have a feeling, I got the feeling that many organ arts organizations over the first few weeks, especially for COVID during the shutdown, ended up having a lot of scrambling to see how they did, what they did, how they could continue reaching and engaging their audiences, their donors, their members, um, the, the arts lovers that, are, uh, that make up their community. Um, and what was exciting at that time was that a lot of the initiatives that grew out were actually artist-led. So a number of projects such as Urgent, run by Mark Marchik, um, other programs where artists would just take their cell phones and do recordings of themselves performing. And you had, you got an opportunity to lives, um, living room performances as well. You ended up with a lot of opportunity to sort of have a more behind the scenes look for what you can actually produce. And one of the things that for us internally at the museum that has come up is that we are looking to present the entirety of the museum currently online as an experience so that we can talk about with how everything, so that the experience that when you walk into the museum, so many people speak about it as being a transformative space, that they're transported somewhere else, that they feel like they've moved to a different area and that in turn becomes a fundamentally educational experience. Um, for us, moving to a digital platform, you don't always have that same opportunity, but it gives us a chance to showcase elements that we're not always able to before. Intimate curator talks, discussions about how exhibitions are constructed, um, how performances are curated and programmed, how they're put up on the stage. Charity, um, is it visual arts and music, but are there other things that you guys are thinking about pushing out digitally? Uh, we've been doing the predominantly visual arts and music. We have some elements of theater that we've been discussing as well. The different demographics and the different genres and disciplines tends to inform what kind of content we can use. One of the things that is interesting is that I know men and you, when you and I were speaking, we ended up with the conclusion that in many respects, in the past three and a half months in Canada and in the past six months around the world, there hasn't necessarily been any substantive technological innovation. Mm -hmm. A lot of the platforms that we're using right now, whether that's Spotify, social media, virtual reality, augmented reality, all of those platforms and those technologies were already present. And so part of the interest, part of the interesting thing about this current experience is that there has been a scramble on the part of the consumer, the audience as well, to make use of and figure out how to use these how to use these platforms and these opportunities. One of the challenges we have faced, at least for us at the museum in terms of reaching an audience, is that social media platforms are not necessarily accessible around the world. We have a strong international audience. And I think you remember saying WhatsApp was really a strong part of your distribution. Is that right? Is that right? It is. It's actually really interesting. It's because Oftentimes when we talk about technology, I think we end up thinking that technology is um, is predominantly high tech. We think about internet, we think about laptops, cell phones, social media. We think about it as virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed realities, 3D printing. But technology is also, again, to go back a little bit to it, to what we were talking about earlier, is that it's socialized. It's a social form of communication. So mm -hmm. one of the things we've realized is that relying on relying on a very personal and what might be considered more 
low tech form of communication has been much more effective and engaging. So in addition to social media channels or uh, e-newsletters and websites, we actually have a team that sends out the information for our programming every week through WhatsApp channels to various WhatsApp groups. And and are you able to 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 see the reach of those easily, or, or um, how, do, how do you know if those? It's interesting. One of the things we had talked about was also how do you track it? How do you measure success mm -hmm. in the digital world? You can go to Facebook. You can go to YouTube. You can get statistics. You have click through rates and open rates. But is that a measure of engagement? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a that's an issue that we've been really grappling with at SoundStreams uh, because you know because of we're a, a, a performance organization and we paused our season because you know we we're still trying to figure out what's feasible next year. Uh, we thought, well, what could we do to take the place of concerts that would keep our subscribers connected to us? Uh, and so we are launching this insider program and in many ways charity it, it addresses something that you've been saying about it doesn't use any new technology it it, it and really is a way of we've communicated to a small group of people that we want to re-envisage a new way forward for sound streams and we want input for the people who care about us so what this digital initiative is really going to do is put me and my team in a room with a small group of people so we can actually have you know, real connection. I mean, because I think when it comes down to this, uh, you know, and I, I'm very interested in issues of digital connection and uh, I, I have a long history of dealing with technology and the arts, but, you know, it's kind of like talking about the hammers and nails instead of talking about the architecture of your dream house, right? And I think that it's good to have people who are versed in those things, but what we really need to do is at the end of the day, say how much engagement are we going to get? And when I mean engagement, it isn't something I can roll up into a uh, CADAC form or something like that. I really want to know, uh, was someone able to better understand where we think we're going? And can I better understand who's on the receiving end of this thing? Uh, and, and I think before, you know, there were genuine efforts about thinking through um, you know, measuring seat numbers and, and having public talkbacks and things like that. But I, I think understanding what our, our fans are desirous of and where they want us to lead uh, and really engaging with feedback, that's where we've been leaning. We, we did something, if I, if I can take a minute here, just to talk about a very specific example. Because like many organizations, uh, you know, obviously to every, you know, the 500, uh, the, the 477 people online right now, uh, I'm a person, uh, a person of color, visible minority here in Canada. And when um, the events of uh, Mr. Floyd's uh, murder happened, there was a lot of pressure on organizations to say something publicly. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that uh, there were a number of organizations that put things out that were just, you know, they use their social channels to say they were in solidarity, but nothing about their hiring practice or curatorial practice or fundraising even said anything that, about those things. Uh, if anyone's curious, I worked with the Canadian Opera Company to craft their response. And I think it's a very, it's a, it's a mea culpa. It's like, hey, we did some stuff that was wrong, uh, but here's how we're going to fix it going forward. And we want to be, you know, we want you to be part of this. Um, we did something where we published some content in a newsletter and on our social channels about Steve Reich, uh, an American minimalist composer, who is someone who anybody would uh, normally associate with us. You know, we, we presented lots of Steve Reich, and in fact, we're hoping to celebrate his 85th birthday in Toronto again next season. But we played a very, we picked a very specific piece to talk about him on that newsletter, and it was a piece called Come Out. Come Out is a tape loop piece in which he was uh, using audio that he collected from a uh, New York City court system, and it was part of an interview of a young, a young man who had been wrongly accused of murder. Uh, and he, he and a group of, they were, I, I can't remember the name, but uh, if it was the Harlem Six or something like that, but they were a group and it was in the uh, late 60s. Um, 
and he took this loop of dialogue where one of the boys said, I had to poke myself to show the police where the bruised blood had, I had to come, to come out to show them. Uh, and so that phrase come out to show them was just interesting in its rhythmic pattern. But obviously the context of that piece, and it was another context of a young African-American male being accused uh, and beaten, accused of murder and beaten by police. We didn't put ourselves in the middle of the context of that, of that piece or the background. We just shared that. And it was really interesting. We had a tremendous amount of feedback of people saying, hey, this was really great. Like this is a lot of information and I had no idea. And kudos for you for finding something that was connected to the moment that wasn't just, um, you, you know, a, 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 a hot button topic as it were, or something that we, or, or a statement that would have just easily aligned us and let us off the hook. So uh, I know that was a long uh, response to that, to that thought, but I really feel that there are ways to connect with people uh, and the digital is just a, a means of doing this, but having opportunities to, to actually hear back from the people that support us are really important. You know, do uh, you have any uh, thoughts or any response to that charity about what those, those points I made? It's funny. Um, I was, as you were uh, right before you were speaking, one of the thoughts that was going through my head was, well, how do we define interaction? Right. It, it's, we've, talked about it a little bit and from a grant reporting or financial or administrative perspective, there might be statistics, but how do we value it? How do we measure interaction even in the real world? Right? Well, yeah. Um, yeah. And also how do you, because really what we're, when you're in the arts, you're not doing it to sell tickets. You're not doing it to have the number of seats. You have to collect and report those statistics, but is interaction a, accurate measure of impact is it sorry go on no, no go on no is it is it an is it an accurate measure of engagement is it an accurate measure of what the intention whether it's a steve reich take take loop piece or a digital replication of a folio from a man uh, of a manuscript an illuminated manuscript whether is that what what is the intention behind it what is the end goal art is supposed to transform it's supposed to educate it's supposed to broaden horizons and a digital platform and audience engagement means that in some cases we might not see that interaction and we might not see that impact social media and even speaking about social media has the capacity to offers so much easy access for calls to action, whether that's for addressing social injustice, for addressing engagement with the arts. But what does that, how does that reflect in terms of actionable, in terms of real life actions? Because one of the things that has come up is if you have a digital platform that presumably offers equal access to people from around the world at any given point in time, and that gives you an opportunity to present artwork or artwork or artists even that represent different heritages, different cultures that might have not the same degree of access elsewhere because we are speaking about systemic imbalance and systemic injustice. Mm -hmm. Then, well, what happens if that, if those changes in that access and that opportunity on a digital platform isn't reflected? in real world institutions. Well, I, I, yeah, no, I, I think that that, when you were talking about how do we measure engagement, you just looped it back, I think, to the actual essence of what it is. Because I think what, how I am hoping to measure engagement is that, that when the community gathers, is there, is there a sense that there's someone missing at the table if we aren't there? Because I think that, that that that's the real test of when when the, you know now we're in a crisis, uh, but even when before this, if if there are decisions made on how we organize ourselves as a society and what kind of resources, if they're not saying, hey, you know, Aga Khan should be at the table. Where are those guys? Uh, it's it's. I think that is a real measure of who's actually part of the discourse of the day, and and many times. Uh, 
we measure those successes in ticket sales and the dollar, the number of zeros after our, our operating grants. And I, and I think that you and I both have seen many organizations that receive quite a lot of support and have a lot of ticket sales. But when it comes down to actually shaping how we build the world, many of those organizations aren't there. In fact, they're notably absent from, from what's going on. Uh, because you know we can keep a moving target of what engagement really is. But when I think about how we measure connection, right? It just, this sounds corny. It maybe shows uh, that I am, I gotta have a good like 20 years on you, whatever. As I think about family, I think about how do we measure the connection of our mothers and fathers and our siblings, right? And you know how I think how we know we have family is that when there's a crisis, they're there, you know, they're actually present and willing to give and support and share all the learnings that they've had from whatever they've come in contact with. And I'm, I would hope that as art enlightened people, that when people need things from us or organizations, our engagement with the, the big hearted artists over the, the over all of the course of art making, over the history of art making, that we can bring, we can bring that light into these conversations in a way that's not um, uh, measured in the way that has failed us so often, the things you were talking about, Charity. It's not about, you know, ticket sales or, you know, it's about can we, can we support others beyond uh, our specific work? It's supporting and it's also, I feel we've had many conversations, you and I, and also just the industry in general, about more broadly, about that this is an opportunity for people to rebuild to reimagine, to recreate a new future. And we do have a tendency to think that, okay, well, we can now replicate what has happened before in our day-to-day -day experience, in our lived experience in the physical virtual in the physical realm rather than the virtual. And that somehow that becomes the new normal online. Mm -hmm. And if we have this opportunity to say, okay, well, we have these new technologies, we have these opportunities for connection. Um, what can we do with it? And is it necessarily on as broad reaching a scale as we might like to think, right? That there's 20 different people tuning in from 20 different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, if one of the interesting projects that's really, that's taking place is that a few months ago, our education department at the museum launched a uh, school field trip, a virtual field trip mm -hmm. tour with a pro with an organization in Mabasa and that they were able to bring a group of school children who would otherwise physically not be able to visit the museum into the space to have an engaged one-on-one -on -one interaction with the curator touring our galleries. Um, another project that uh, our one of our part of our digital and IT team has been working on is the is working through mixed reality and augmented reality and 3D printing for our objects and artifacts. I know speaking for other organizations in town, some place like Tapestry Opera has also launched a virtual reality opera experience. Mm -hmm. I think all of those, uh, a couple of years ago, I think um, the city of Toronto actually presented a piece, a virtual reality piece where they imagined what would happen if nature took over Toronto, the mm -hmm. world. Then. Um, and what's exciting is that in all those instances, those projects had the opportunity to engage audiences in a way that wasn't just about numbers. It physically or quite literally dropped them into a new reimagined reality. And that's one of the benefits of a digital platform, especially when you're talking about interaction engagement, mm -hmm. right? It's not, sometimes there's very, there's low stakes engagement. You said an emoji, you type a comment. Mm -hmm. but thank you very much for the comments, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so there's a, low, there's a level of low stakes engagement, but then there's also the higher stakes kind of engagement, which is once you have this opportunity to see something different than what you have access to otherwise, how does that shape or change what you know? The web hasn't gotten any larger or smaller necessarily in the last three months. Mm -hmm. We've been more focused on it. And our value judgments and our value systems for what we see and what we consume and how we interact with digital technology has really also substantially increased. 
Mm -hmm. I, I will, you know, I, I want to make sure I, I just cite one very simple low tech uh, example of technology's use in, in connecting us, which is, uh, and I think you came to one of the last ones we had before COVID got shut down, but I, me and a colleague, Heather Kelly at the conservatory run this monthly arts gathering, a Sanka set uh, that people come to and it's, you know, people can just meet other people. But when COVID hit, we obviously couldn't do that. And we took it online and, and the first initial ones were, were, were good. But after, uh, after George's, George Floyd's murder, I made a concerted effort to invite a number of my American friends on. Because I realized for a lot of us in Canada, this was kind of looking through the glass at something that was evolving over there. And there wasn't a touch point to actually make it real in a lot of ways. Um, and so we had this now, finally, the technology allowed us to have uh, people from all over the world be there. And what was really interesting, uh, we were able to, we did it over Zoom when we were able to use breakout rooms. And for those 20 minutes or so, people actually got to know each other much better in a way that they would have if we did it in person, because that protected space of being like, okay, we're four people, we're here for however many minutes. Um, and what I do know is that it built real, a real sense of community for those moments that uh, that we were not able to do in person because uh, uh, the dynamics of us moving towards the biggest fish in the room is always a, uh, a temptation in these events. And we stop that in this thing. And we're allowed people to actually connect in the random breakout room assi assignment. So, um, so uh, even, even though that's not groundbreaking to anybody, what I would say to anyone that's that's listening is that, that this is so needed now to pull people together into into rooms and talk about what's happening. Because um, I think, as Charity was saying, I think from those chats, the rebuilding will naturally occur. That we won't go back to the way that things were beforehand. I don't think it will go back to how it was beforehand, and I think it's also a good time for us to reflect on what kind of choices digital technology offers us because that's been foregrounded. Every day we make multiple choices, which shows we attend to what we're going to wear, how we're going to listen to it, who we invite, um, whether we pay for a ticket or whether the ticket is too expensive. Mm -hmm. We make so many choices and that informs the type of engagement we look for or measure or seek in terms of arts and arts production. When you have a digital platform, and in theory, everything is always accessible, mm -hmm. those decisions and that decision making is much is foregrounded. And it goes back a little bit to speaking about this concept of digital culture and digital content as being a brand new stage, something that we need to program and curate and create specifically for, and not just simply treat it as a substitute for a live experience during this time when we can't host something in person. Mm -hmm. Charity, can I ask you, uh, and we talked a little bit about this earlier too, um, we asked the, uh, the audience about what they were watching and what they were connecting with digitally. Do you wanna share anything that you may have seen or anything you're doing in these COVID times in terms of digital arts uh, access? Um, I have to admit, a lot of the videos I've been watching have to be the ones that I review for posting for our museum website. That mm -hmm. being said, something I really enjoyed taking a look at was a lot of the Alvin Ailey productions and also the Met Opera productions as well. And then there's been some community groups here in Toronto that have been facilitating live streams of performances specifically from India mm -hmm. as well. So for me, one of the great opportunities is that you can see you can see what people try to create given the current constraints and I love that right now artists are really really working to see how they can push those boundaries change the shape of what we understand and what we experience and to sort of they on their own are redefining the terms and the expectations the prayers for what we think of as live performance for music mm -hmm. I, I, well, I was saying it's so, so interesting that even though Charity and I are both come out of a music space, both of us have been watching a lot of Ailey uh, on YouTube. And I was saying to Charity earlier that what was shocking to me, you know, that I'm, I'm a huge fan of both 
uh, Alvin Ailey and New York City Ballet uh, and thought of them as kind of like co-equal uh, Everests in the, in, the, in the mountain range of, of dance. But gosh, Ailey has just spent so much more time thinking about capturing their dance in video uh, that the production itself is of a much higher quality. But I have to say, shockingly to me, that the, the level of dance that was coming out of Ailey was shocking to me about how, how much more uh, incredible it was than even the heights of the New York City Ballet. So for me, that was a really interesting thing. On, on the downside of that, I'm kind of glad to see, I think initially there were a lot of uh, bedroom composer or bedroom musicians kind of doing things online. And man, it was just like, okay, I remember why I don't go to these shows. Uh, but I, I do have to say, surprisingly, and, and again, she's she's not someone I would have thought would have been delivering at such a high level, but uh, the singer, American singer and pianist Nora Jones is doing, a, I think, a daily uh, YouTube cast, and she's destroying in that thing, too. It is, it's just, uh, uh, it's so amazing to see someone, uh, anyone with, uh, that, with talent being able to deliver it in such a personal and direct way. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm kind of surprised about, about, about that too. Um, Charity, do you think, uh, I, I think we should talk really quickly, uh, cause I, we're probably coming to the end just about how digital is rolled out in an organization. We had talked a little bit about that with regard to like, uh, job description and work-life balance and things like that. <laughs> Right now, um, it is a case of all hands on deck at our organization. And I chuckle because um, I think that tends to always be the case at museums, or at arts institutions in general. Um, but in this, in this case for us, moving forward, one of the main questions we've had is, well, what do we look to, how, how is this new reality that we're all de dealing with sustainable for the future? Right. Is it a staffing resource? Is it a creative resource? Is it a reconceptualization of how we occupy space? Um, because the reality is that we will virtual will in all likelihood never diminish. It may not grow at the same speed or rate that we've become used to in the last several months, but we will be moving everybody. And I know the museum certainly will be moving towards a hybrid reality, one where there is a physical museum and performances and places you can visit, take a look at art, listen to some music, but then there's also going to be a virtual one where in some case, in some ways, the possibilities are limitless, mm -hmm. but in other ways they're not because we are bounded by certain restrictions that are in place, whether that is internet access available from around the world, whether that is whether or not certain social media platforms are easy to navigate for individuals of different demographics or abilities, um, whether or not social media platforms or various platforms, period, are accessible in different geographies. Mm -hmm. um, I know when we were discussing WhatsApp, one of the comments that did come up was that it tends to not be, it tends to be used very much internationally, but not so much within Canada. And it was one of the discussions that you, that one of our conversations that came up, which was, you know, in Canada and North America, United States, Canada, we tend to think of certain ways of connecting with people as being the norm. Facebook Messenger, email, uh, Zoom calls now. But in so many other regions of the world, that's not necessarily the case. I, I think, too, that, and Cherry and I did speak about this uh, offline, uh, and I think it's important for all of us, especially the uh, the folks that are kind of emerging out of the uh, out of colleges like Humber, that what's going on right now is that we're entering this new medium in which almost nobody who's working in these organizations is trained or understands the language that they're speaking. It's almost as if, and again, I, I spoke about this earlier, but when people made the leap from theater to TV, it would be like shooting TV with no one who had any knowledge of how cameras and lighting work, and I and I feel like because these pro, these platforms are so user friendly, uh, we often skip the step of okay, well, how does this program or how does this initiative translate digitally? Like, how does it actually feel? Like, what are we actually saying? 
I mean, I don't, I don't want to put too fine or, or, or a point on this, but uh, the, the fact that Charity and I are both locked into two separate boxes, I mean, it's not, it's actually not, it's a choice that someone has made, right? That to, to divide us here and to allow us a, a way to be less conversational than if we were looking at each other, if there was another vantage point. Um, but I, I think oftentimes decisions being made about what happens in digital are made by people that if you asked around the table, and I would really urge everyone to do this, hey, are you guys actually watching any of this stuff on your own? Are you in part of this conversation? Or is this something that you just think that we should be doing? Because I hope we all have the courage to say, um, hey, we don't, we don't actually know what we're doing here. We need some help. And uh, maybe there's room for people who do have uh, audiovisual vocabulary that translates well into the digital space. And maybe we should get those people uh, in our company, we should consult with them or whatever. But uh, what, what I will say is this thing of Charity and I looking at that, I hope that that's not gonna be that this somehow will be able to have a much more interactive and we can, you know, we are sharing space on your screens, but it's clearly de delineated. And that's, that's so against, I think, what this medium uh, should be doing. It's Madam Charity, just a quick friendly reminder that you have 10 more minutes to go. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I, I will keep this short. One of the things that I was going to say was in terms of the, this delineation, Menon, that you're speaking about, one of the interesting things is that digital culture doesn't allow us, digital platforms doesn't currently allow us to make up for the richness of a real world experience. And that doesn't make it a poorer experience. Right, but if you and I were sitting down in a cafe or at Insomnia, one of your gatherings, we would have the opportunity to not only speak to each other, we'd be jumping in, we would interrupt. There would be moments where someone else would come by, there'd be ambient noise, there'd be sight and sound and smell and texture. Mm -hmm. And those experiences are not just, those elements are not just missing from a digital platform in many respects. Those elements can't necessarily, they can't be replicated. And so the intimacy you assume you have, right? It's, I remember having a really interesting conversation just yesterday with uh, one of the performers that's going to be part of our Flamenco Festival this coming fall. Mm. And we were discussing how the experience of production needed to be both a hybrid one, it had to have a live component, mm -hmm. which could be live streamed or recorded and edited to present online as well as to an in-person audience, assuming we're able to do this in November. Um, but also it had to be virtual. There needed to be something created for virtual. And she was speaking about how she would try, she had tried to create, you know, a sense of intimacy with the audience during some of her live performances or live streams from home. And you can't do it the same way. You can't reach out and touch somebody. You can't, um, you can't, you can't choose to turn away, to not look, to make a whisper to your partner beside you. Oh, you know, I really love when that happened. Yeah. And one of the things that this digital medium takes away from us in some regards, and while also offering, is that is the option of choice, right? I think about product productions like, for example, the Met Opera or even Alvin Ailey, where those choices are made specifically for how is this framed? Which section of the choreography are you capturing? Is this a close-up of a performer? Is this a wide-angle shot? Do you see the conductor, right? Um, even the behind-the-scenes moments, where you film, who you talk to. And in many respects, I think the real-world experience of going to a live performance or production or live art experience has those, those elements, the sight, the sound, the smell, the mm -hmm. touch of food, the feeling of the chair. Um, those are all part of the added value elements that go towards a live experience. Mm -hmm. When you're on a screen, you as the audience member do not have that agency, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter right now, unless someone is zooming in, I don't even know if you can do it. Mm -hmm. You are stuck with two windows and there's men and then there's myself. Yeah. yeah. If you choose to look at somewhere else, there's really no, you're, you're not looking at the presentation anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's interesting that digital platforms, while in some, many respects increasing, increase audience agency, 
they also decrease audience agency simultaneously, just mm -hmm. in different formats. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things I did find was that as soon as the shutdown started, it became fairly apparent in the first four weeks. And one of this is one of the reasons we had this poll was asking, how did you choose what you wanted to see? And did you discover anything new? Because social media, especially if that's a, our primary form of arts consumption these days, is a little bit of a self-created bubble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've selected your interests on Facebook. You follow these people on Instagram. Yeah. You've heard of TikTok, and so you decide to go take a look at what it was, and the feed tells you what you might see first and foremost. But that is that means that you end up being in a little bit of a self-created bubble that's a feedback loop that says, oh, you like these things, let's give you more of them. Mm -hmm. And one of the exciting things about live performance, even if you, even when as an audience member, you make the choice of where do I go? What do I go see? Do I buy this ticket? Do I choose this performance? Who do I go with? Is that there's always that added element of the unknown, mm -hmm. right? It's very hard to leave in the middle of a performance. You can, but it's challenging. And so you are routinely in, in the real world in live performance, you're routinely confronted with something you don't know, something that is new. And currently digital platforms, especially as we've been using them in the last few months, hasn't necessarily foregrounded that. And I think that's a big, huge piece that's missing. I mean, I'm thinking of a couple of things that, you know, when my, uh, when my brother, when we were teenagers, sometimes he'd bring home records and I'd say, where did that, you know, come from? And he said, I don't know anything about this band, but look at this cover. These guys got to be interesting or whatever, right? So this idea that you could just run into stuff, that's a huge problem that we have to figure out. Uh, but also the, the, um, the ability for us to step away from content in the middle if we're kind of having a momentary dip. I'm thinking I just saw uh, a video essay yesterday about uh, the film Magnolia. And I was just thinking if you're watching it online, you might click away before the plague of frogs uh, falls on the whole, uh, on everyone in the film. And, and you would really miss a huge thing. Uh, and, and also, I just wanted to say, you, when you're talking about things surrounding performance, what digital, uh, you know, scoops out, like, you know, smell and other things, I'm thinking about the Indian performances that you were talking about, and if you couldn't smell incense or things like that, how strangely disembodied that would be. But I, I remember thinking, going to lots of dance performances in New York, and one of them being the, the last Merce Cunningham company show, and being able to be in that space and see all these people in the dance community hugging each other and crying and and realizing that this huge era was ending i mean how would that be replicated online right right now they just put the show up and you wouldn't have any other connection to it um so i think figuring out how people can come together in a, in a loose way where they have choice about how they move and interact that that would be a huge opportunity i, I know it's so nerve-wracking for people to walk up to people at a concert that they don't know and say, hey, you know, you're interested in this, so am I. Uh, but maybe we need to figure out a way to do that uh, in, an, in a messy space. Speaking of messy spaces, I had a, it's a little bit of a fanciful notion and I know we're running out of time here, so I will be quick. Uh, one of my dream realities for a hybrid scenario for especially performing arts, but mm -hmm. also just arts in general is uh, a, few years back when the Pokemon uh, smartphone craze was yes. taking place, one of my favorite things to see was literally groups, like groups of five to 20 people in person, out in public, chasing down Pokemon together, chasing down virtual Pokemon together. And I know it's a little bit silly because it's a, it's a, it's a video game, but part of it is also, well, how do you create community and how do you create a shared experience that makes the virtual as real as mm -hmm. the real world. Mm -hmm. When I first moved back to Canada, my first gig was running 918 Bathurst. And I remember that it was a Pokemon Go site and people started showing up and the, the board was like, well, we, should we do something about this? I said, are you kidding? We're a gathering space. People are actually coming. <laughs> uh, they're st stepping in and they're splitting, right? So, uh, so it was a, it, it's something like that we've got to figure out how to add to to what we're all currently offering, that would be great. <laughs> um, I do think Pokemon Go is a 
great place to sort of end this conversation. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> um, but again, if anyone has questions afterwards, happy to answer or address offline or through questions or chat. Yeah, we're pretty pretty easily findable on social media and whatever. So I'd love to connect with anyone who has. And and I have to say uh, that this is this opportunity has been really great for me because I didn't know Charity that well before. And I, I think she's just really an incredible person. I'm looking forward to seeing her career develop. She's just, we're so lucky to have her in Toronto. I have to say, Amanda and I've had a really, really great experience working with you, talking with you. Um, these conversations we've had, especially in the last week or so, have been one of the most, some of the most illuminating and insightful and fulfilling. That's great. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. It was a very useful conversation and I'm personally a Pokemon Go fan, so <laughs> it was good to bring it up. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so now please, I want to say to all of you that uh, we're staying right where we are now and there is no need to go to other session because my colleague Amanda will now introduce uh, our artists, our first artist for today, and she will call you uh, there. So please stay here, stay tuned. See you soon. <laughs>